kind of about this evening's message. I'm not kind of, I'm very excited about this evening's message. I think you're going to find it very inspiring and uplifting. I hope so. Genesis chapter 7. Going back to the Old Testament, first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 7. Beginning at verse 1, we're going to read through verse 10. And we'll stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. And the word of the Lord reads, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female, of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord had commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth, and Noah went in, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him, into the ark, because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts, and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls, and of everything that creepeth upon the earth, there went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah, and it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. Master, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, God, for another opportunity, God, to walk into the house of God and have sound mind and to have a, a whole body, healthy and well. Master, as the bread of life is about to go forth, we ask that your anointing would rest upon your messenger, God, that you'd help us to deliver this word as you've placed it in my spirit, that every soul that hears it might be blessed and encouraged. Lord, that every individual, whether they be here physically in this place or whether they be listening by tape, but God, that every individual would be encouraged to know that there's room enough for them. Master, bless the messenger. Bless those that would hear the message. Help us to receive God what you'd have us to receive at this hour and this time. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. You know, it's so interesting. It is so interesting to me how that we often see Noah's Ark depicted as containing two animals of every kind. That's how we're always told it happened, aren't we? People can't read. That's the problem. It's just simple. People can't read. They're ignorant. They're stupid. Some people use as an argument against the natural existence of the gay or lesbian orientation the fact that God brought the animals in two by two. Male and female, to keep the species alive. There were two of each animal on the ship, on the boat, on the ark. And yet, interestingly enough, that is not the instructions that I read God giving to Noah in Genesis chapter 7. As a matter of fact, he begins by saying, Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by seven the male and his female. Well, that's not two. Guess what? It's not seven either. It's fourteen. The Lord said you're to take by seven the male and his female. 
which would mean seven couples. The male and female times seven would be fourteen. But wait a minute. We read further that the unclean beasts, he said, were to be taken by two. The male and his female. So again, the equation is actually enlarged a little bit. It's not merely two animals. No. Actually, he's to take how many of the unclean? Four. Two pairs of two. So the unclean, God wants them to have four. And the clean, God wants them to have two. But he wants seven pairs of the clean beast, not just two, not just one pair, seven pairs of the clean beast. He doesn't want just one pair of the unclean. He wants two pairs of the unclean. I can tell you a little secret that God knows that might explain why God would have done it this way, but it's also going to give Jerry Falwell a headache. Did you know that it is a natural scientific fact of nature? This is not Brother Ma making it up. This is a fact of absolute scientific fact that many, 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 many species of animals, for whatever reason, experience same-sex coupling. There are wolves, wolves mate for a lifetime, that will couple up with another male wolf rather than a female. There are birds that will couple up with another male instead of a female. They never produce offspring. They never do what is supposed to be natural for them. And yet, they engage in what is for them a very natural practice, and that is copulation. They do do that. But they don't bear offspring. They don't, you know, achieve uh, children. They don't have litters. Well, I've got news for you. God ain't stupid. God knows this. So when you put a bunch of animals on the ark, honey, you better put enough to make sure you're going to have a couple of them that are going to decide they want to have babies. You following me? You better put enough of them boogers on there to make sure at least two of them are going to have babies. Somebody said, well, God could have just made all of them where they would uh, multiply the right way, yada, yada. Sweetheart, why do we have to rewrite the Bible? Why do we have to rewrite the scriptures? Why do you think God just has nothing better to do than run through the world constantly changing everything to make it work in the manner that you think is perfect? i got news for you. Even the most imperfect creation in God's creation is part of his creation, and it serves a purpose, and it serves a function. You may not understand it. You may not know why. You, know, you may not understand the reasoning, but God understands the reasoning. We've got doctors that can open your body and take out your spleen and have no idea what it's used for. But they know when it gets inflamed and infected, it needs to come out. And you can live without it. They know that much. They know that the appendix can become inflamed and infected and that sometimes the appendix needs to be removed and they know that you can live without your appendix. But ask them, what does your appendix do? And they'll tell you, we really don't know. Amen. So I've got, excuse me, I've got news for you. If God, in his process of creation, has placed things in 
the creation that don't seem to go along with the norm and don't seem to follow all the rules and don't seem to do just exactly like everything else does, that doesn't mean they're wrong, that doesn't mean they're evil, that doesn't mean it's ungodly, that doesn't mean it's unholy, it means simply that it's different. Hello now. But it's still part of the creation. And based on that theory, i got news for you. There are lots of queens on Noah's Ark. Amen. There were a lot of animals on Noah's Ark that had no intention of ever coupling up with a member of the opposite sex and having a litter or having children, having babies. There were many animals on that ark that had absolutely no intention of that. And that's why God said, here's what you do. This is the best way to try to make sure you're doing it. Take a male and a female once twice, three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times. Now, out of 14 pairs, you're bound to get a few of them that are going to copulate and have babies. And the seed will survive. Now, with the unclean animals, the same thing. It wouldn't be very smart to put all your hopes in one pair. There's a million things can be wrong with an, <laughs> with an animal, with a human being for that matter, too. That female might be sterile. That male might not be able to produce offspring. His sperm count may be too low or whatever the case might be. I'm not even making a joke. You know, I'm serious. These things happen. God's not stupid. He said, take by twos the male and his female. See, we know that by twos meant take two pairs because in when he talks about the by sevens, the male and his female, let me ask you a question. Somebody right now who's so good at math that you're able to stand up and divide seven by two. How are you going to get males and females and come up with seven? Because the Lord specifically says the male and his female, meaning a female to go with her. Uh, with him. You see? So therefore, it can't possibly be that the Lord was talking about take seven of them. No, 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 no. He wasn't talking about taking seven of them. He's talking about, talking about taking seven pairs of them to make sure that there would be plenty of animals that, uh, that when the, the floodwaters receded, that they would have plenty of opportunity to reproduce and create, you know, a, a lineage and to be able to uh, recreate and procreate so that the uh, animal of that kind could continue to exist. Now, a lot of people act like, you know, I've heard, I remember going to Sunday school, you know, we're always told Noah put one of every kind of animal on the ark. Well, that's dumb. <laughs> that's dumb. Can you see, or two, I'm sorry, of every animal on the ark. Can you see two Tyrannosaurus and two Brontosaurus up on Noah's Ark? No, it's not going to happen, is it? Let me ask you a question. Where in the world, geographically, where in the world is there a place that every single species of animal that has ever existed lives? That's right. There's no such place. Different breeds are indigenous to different parts of the world. Therefore, all Noah could do was put on his boat what was available to him. And all the offspring that we have, all of the various species that we have today, are the byproduct in many instances of crossbreeding of different breeds and what have you that were the same uh, gene pool, but they just happened to have slight differences. And this then explains why the dinosaur age came to a raging halt suddenly and quickly, and why they were suddenly buried in hundreds of feet of sediment all over the world, all at once, and why scientists tell us that 
Man did not live while the site, while uh, the dinosaur lived, because we have no remains of man to be found anywhere near the remains of the dinosaur. Well, no kidding, you no kid. Noah didn't live where the dinosaurs were. Do you hear me now? Noah didn't live where the, but that didn't mean the dinosaurs didn't live while Noah was living. They didn't get on the ark because they were not indigenous to Noah's part of the world. Therefore, when the floodwaters came, everything God said that he had created would be destroyed, and everything was wiped out. That included the enormous animals like the dinosaur. Now, see, isn't it funny how it really makes perfect sense, and it, you know, it kind of falls into place, and all of these preachers just love to complicate it, and of course the scientists love to complicate it even more, but really, it's really a simple thing to understand. It's not a difficult thing to understand. But you know what? We know today that the ark is a type of Christ. We know today that the ark represents salvation. It represents that place we can run into and be saved. And Jesus Christ in the New Testament is the New Testament ark. He is that place, Manuel, where we can run into, hallelujah, and be saved. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong and mighty power. The righteous run therein and are saved. Hallelujah. Jesus is the ark for us today. Hallelujah. And I've got news for you. There's room for everybody. There's room for everybody in the ark. Manuel, there isn't just room for the hetero. There's room for the homo. There's room for everybody on the ark. God planned this thing in such a way so that everybody could be included and nobody had to be left out. And even though there may have been five or six animals on that boat in any given species who would never try to procreate with an opposite, a, a member of the opposite sex of their species, that animal still was given life and given the opportunity to survive and given the opportunity to go on after the flood. Because God isn't stupid. He knows a lot of people in this world act like procreation and that's all everything's about. That's the end all and be all. You know what? That's the same mentality as the old phallic religions of Babylon. It's all about having babies. We wonder why the Roman Catholic Church has been encouraging people for centuries, have babies, have babies, have babies, have babies. That's how our numbers grow. That's how our power and influence in countries grows. Because the more children you have, the more members we claim. But you know what? They're just borrowing from the Babylonian phallic religion that practically worships the male semen and worships the male organ as though it were something godly and something divine and something wonderful because it's able to produce life. Now see, God can produce life by himself alone. But a male cannot produce life by himself alone. Neither can a female produce life by herself alone. It doesn't work that way. You've got to bring two of them together in order to, to actually produce life. And the truth of the matter is today that on this ark that we call the gospel, there's room for everybody. There's room for both. You see, it's interesting to me, Jose, that God included the unclean. Amen. He didn't include as many. But he included them. He said, you know what? I created this mess, and I made it to work a certain way. And those beasts which are identified as unclean are generally identified as unclean for one simple reason, and that is because uh, their dietary habits as a rule are based upon scavenging. They eat decaying flesh. They eat rotting flesh. 
They eat garbage. They eat that which others throw away. Look at the goat. You know, they tease about goats. You can feed a goat just about anything. You can feed it a, a, a can and it'll eat the can. Because they just eat whatever you put in front of them. Look at the lobster, which is unclean according to uh, Jew Jewish dietary law. And the lobster, what a wonderful delicacy it is to eat. But honey, listen, the lobster serves an important function on the floor of the ocean. It eats up all the junk and the garbage that would otherwise pollute the waters. So God knows, a lot of humans don't get this, but God knows that whether you like it or not, whether it's labeled in your mind as clean or unclean, it doesn't really matter because it serves an important purpose. It has an important function. It does something to help keep the ecology in line and to keep everything in balance. Well, Brother Mark, if you're trying to tell me that homosexuals exist in order to keep humanity in balance, I think you're crazy and I think it's a demon. Somebody needs to cast that demon out of you. You big moron. You ever heard the little word called overpopulation? There are species all over the face of this planet that will populate and populate and populate to a certain point. But you know what? If things get too crowded, they quit. Because automatically, biologically, their body says, there's not room for any more. But there's one species on the face of our planet that has the potential of populating and populating and populating and populating and unless they make a concerted effort and they say you know what concerted effort if they say uh, if they don't come to the conclusion you know what we need to quit because we're running out of room my mother my mother's parents and my dad's parents both my dad's parents had 12 kids my mother's parents had 10 kids now here the world living in a little two-bedroom house Having ten kids doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? It's not a lot of room. You're crowded. Everybody crowded up on one. You know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But you see, as human beings, we can do that. We can make those decisions. You can live in a one-bedroom apartment and have twelve kids if you want to. So yes, God does put certain features into the biological, ecological system that helps to prevent humanity from going hog wild crazy and producing so many people that the planet simply cannot support them. Look at countries like Ethiopia where people are starving to death. Why? Because of overpopulation. They can't eat for God's sakes, but they sure can make love. They haven't got food that well, but oh, good God, they sure do have beds or cots or something. And obviously, they don't have television. <laughs> See, as human beings, we're the only species on the face of the planet that can do that to ourselves and overpopulate ourselves into starvation. So if God puts in the animal kingdom same-sex oriented animals, then it absolutely makes sense to me that God would put in the human kingdom same-sex oriented individuals as well. Because by doing so, he is preventing, look, if you consider how many gay people up in Dallas alone, And you think about the number of human beings that if these, all these men and all these women were to have married and had children and you know, and you think about how many human beings have not been born into the world because they're not in heterosexual relationships. 
Man, I'll tell you what, you realize in a hurry that the ecological benefit of GLBT people is actually a very positive benefit. You realize in a hurry, you know, a city with a population of, what, four million roughly here in Dallas right now, we could be looking square in the face of five or six million people, seriously. If all the GLBT people in our community were out there having kids and raising families. But we've got jackasses like Jerry Falwell worried that the human race is going to run itself extinct because of the queers. Now how dumb is that? How dumb is that? You honestly believe that because of people who are gay and lesbian oriented that all of a sudden the human race is going to wind up extinct and that one morning the last man on earth is going to wake up and say, well doggone it, my lover died and here I am all. Dumb. But God puts things in place in order to keep controls, in order to keep everything in balance. Instead of looking at other people and saying, well, they, they don't have no right to be the way they are. That's evil. That's ungodly. That's unholy. No, 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 no. No, what you need to do is look at it and say, you know what? They're not like me. But that doesn't make it unnatural. That makes it different. It may be natural for them. What's natural for them is not natural for me. What's natural for me is not natural for them. But you know what? What is natural for them serves humanity and serves the planet and what is natural for me serves humanity and it serves the planet it just serves in a different area and in a different way and I tell the truth today makes sense don't it then we look at the New Testament In the New Testament, we look at the story of Peter on the housetop in Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16, and then also verses 34 and 35. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the earth. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, till and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spoke unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Then Peter is at the house of Cornelius in verses 34 and 35, and Peter speaks these words which were born of the vision that he had on the rooftop, on the housetop in Acts chapter 10. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. I wonder how many of those animals that were getting on the ark, if Noah had been aware of their sexual orientation, he might not have said, Lord, this one shouldn't get on. Lord, we shouldn't take this one because it's not got the right orientation. And it would crack me up because the Lord would turn around and say, that's all right, Noah, because the gal next to him hadn't got the right orientation either. You know what I'm saying? But you see, it's easy for us to look at the situation in the natural and think that we can weed out and we can decide who gets in and who doesn't get in. Who's considered clean and who isn't considered clean. After all, Mom, if, if you're considered a clean beast, like, a, a, let's say, for instance, a cow, 
You're considered a clean beast, but you don't perform naturally. You don't do what is natural for you. You don't do what you're supposed to do. Then in many people's minds, you would be as useless and you would be as worthless as the throwaway unclean beast. Because they're too ignorant to realize the function that the unclean beast serves, number one. And they're too ignorant to realize that God created that beast the way God created that beast so that it could serve yet another function. It may not serve the function of procreation, but it will serve a variety of other functions, many other functions. It's funny, I, you know, people who know anything about gay people, you let a woman fall down in the street and yell rape in a gay neighborhood and see if half the neighborhood don't come running out to help you. Now let that happen in a straight neighborhood and see how many of those macho, macho straight boys are going to run out to help you. Sometimes God let that queer cow live because the queer cow is protected and he's going to protect the rest of the herd. Maybe that's his function. Maybe that cow is the very one cow that will take more thought of the female cows that are having their babies and he'll make sure that that cow is protected and warm and that cow is where it needs to be when it needs to be there so that the babies can be born healthy and well while Danny Bull is out there rolling around not giving a fly, not caring less. How many women have their macho honcho Husbands, you know, they're, they're all pregnant with their husband's baby and their husband's out bowling and their, their husband's out at the bar and their husband's out playing sports and I watch it on Dr. Phil all the time and their husband out there doing all these things and who's there comforting them? Who's there helping them through their process and through their pregnancy? I'll tell you who, it's their little friend Gary. So you see, little Gary serves the function. He serves an important function. He plays an important role. And there is absolutely no danger like a eunuch. There is no danger of Gary wanting to get involved with the lady sexually. There's no danger of that. Just like the eunuch. The eunuch could guard the children of the king. The eunuch could guard the princesses. He could guard uh, the queens. He could guard all the women that are the property, as it were, of the king or of the potentate of any given land, and never one time he's going to make a move on them. But he's going to serve an extremely important function. And you know the same thing's true of GLBT people. Oh, they may not do the procreating. They may not do the copulating. They may not do all that. But you know what? Believe me, they're doing something. That's very important to our society. And I'm going to tell you, for all those people out there running around, you know, kill the queers like Fred Phelps and his crowd, I've got news for you. If all of a sudden the GLBT community were all at once removed from the face of this planet, I'm going to tell you what would happen. The world would literally collapse. It would. It would collapse. Because you don't know the contribution that these people are making. You don't know how many charitable organizations rely upon the money of that big queen up there. You don't know how many uh, hospitals exist because some big fat old queer donated millions and millions and millions of dollars to help it exist. You don't know how many churches were built at the hands of gay lesbian workers. You don't know how many cars you're driving were manufactured by gay lesbian people. You don't realize how much of the furniture you're sitting on was manufactured by gay lesbian people. You don't realize how many of the appliances you use every day were manufactured, designed, created by gay lesbian people. When you go back in history and you look at the contribution 
that the GLBT community has made. They talk about how the GLBT community has contributed so much in the way of arts and, you know, the, the arts and dance and theater and all that. But honey, I got news for you. GLBT people have a lot more going on for them than just knowing how to get up on a stage and put on a show. There are books you can go to the library and read about gay history and read about characters in gay history. You ever heard of a little fella called Alexander the Great? Where's the three dollar bill? But look at what he accomplished. Look at how he changed the world. Look at how he affected the face of planet Earth. There were popes in Rome that were gay. There were popes in Rome that were married, had children running through the halls of the Vatican. But what I'm trying to get at today is there's room in the ark for all of us. There's room for all of us. Nobody can stand at the door and say, no, you know what? You don't perform the way this one performs, and therefore I deem you unclean. God has said, that which I have called, that which I have cleansed, you shall in no wise call unclean or common. God said, if it's past my litmus test, I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it acts like. If it's past my test, then it is what I say it is. And if I say it's clean, if I say it's holy, if I say it's righteous, if I, if I say it's godly, if I say it's saved, it's saved. And don't you doubt it, don't you question it, and don't you dare stand in the way. Whew, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Mother Peter was looking at a vision of goats and shellfish and all the beasts that are labeled by the Jewish faith unclean by the Old Testament law. God said, Arise, Peter, kill any piece. I can't do that, Lord. I've never eaten anything unclean. Finally, the Lord said, Peter, that which I have cleansed. But you know what's funny? Think about this for a minute. God told Peter he cleansed those animals. He said, that which I have cleansed, thou shalt in no wise call unclean or common. But Peter was still looking at goats. He was still looking at shellfish. He was still looking at pork, uh -huh, pigs, and swine. Well, isn't that funny, man? Well, according to most churches I know, they claim God's in the business of changing you. They tell me that God wants to make you into what you're supposed to be so that you can stop being what you're not supposed to be. That's what they tell me. But Peter wasn't looking at animals that had been cleansed and changed, uh, he was looking at animals that had been cleansed uh, and were still the animals that they started out being from the get-go. Because just because God comes into your life and cleanses you, doesn't mean you're no longer you. Doesn't mean that your basic nature suddenly, molecularly, is transformed, hallelujah. We don't need organizations like Exodus International to help change people. What they're trying to do is they're trying to make the goat into a sheep. And God is saying, how dare you that which I have called clean? Don't you dare call it unclean or common. And while they think they're doing God's big service, what they're really doing is angering God. My Bible said it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. In plain old-fashioned English, you don't want to take off Jesus. If the righteous scarcely be saved, scarcely be saved, and we all read it tonight, where shall the sinner and the ungodly stand? 
if the righteous scarcely be saved. You know why the righteous are scarcely going to be saved, men? Well, because half these morons are going to stand before God in the judgment, and all of a sudden, God is going to lay out a list of those things that he has against them, those things that they've been doing, the things that they've been operating, the way that they've been doing things that offended him and troubled him and disturbed him. And he's going to go down that list. And when he gets to the bottom, he'll say, it's not but by the grace of God that you're getting through this gate, buddy. You worked so hard to change the goat into a sheep when I was saying all along that the goat was clean. Phew. Hope you're getting something from this tonight. I don't preach a lot of messages, as you know, that have a kind of a GLBT theme, per se, you know. But this particular message the Lord laid on my heart. He said, this is a message about inclusion. This is to help people know there's room in the ark. <laughs> Don't be afraid, honey. Get on the gangplank and walk on up. There's room in the ark for all of us. And if God has labeled you clean, then, sweetheart, you're going to be one of those four. No one may look at you as unclean. But before they can get on that ark, God must have cleansed them. Before they got on that ark, God must surely have cleansed them. So that while they looked unclean to Moses, Whoa, glory to Noah, excuse me, they looked shiny, pure, and holy in the sight of God. Amen. How do you like that? I want you to know it is God's prerogative today. There's room in the ark for all of us. Clean and unclean are terms that we use and distinctions that we see as human beings. But the line between the holy and the profane is obliterated by grace when the Lord says simply, Do not call unclean or common that which I have cleansed. The goat may still be a goat, and the lobster may still be a lobster as Peter envisioned them uh, being lowered from heaven in a sheep. What made them different was not their appearance or their makeup, but rather the one vital fact that God himself had cleansed them and he had now labeled them clean by his word. Hallelujah. And I want you to know, uh, Manuel, it is God's prerogative to label anything, anyone, anytime, anywhere clean by His Word. God can call it clean if He wants to call it clean. Romans chapter 9, 14 through 24, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God or is there unfairness with God? 